born in the state of New Jersey, the sign of the key, circa 1669, which means it's also celebrating its 350th anniversary. And we're here with Greg Perry, curator, to explore more about what colonial tavern life may have been like. And we've received a number of questions from his followers. And we'll start with Adam, who is asking what kind of food may have been served. Uh, what, what kind of food would have been served? Well, the food vary depending upon the year of the tavern, such as the sign of the key here. It would have been very basic. There would have been primarily one entree per uh, per day. I mean, it could be mutton, it could be a quail, it could be pheasant, uh, it could be a pig, it could be pork. So chicken, whatever, whatever the fare of the day. But there was only one choice of, of meal. Uh, and essentially, you come in the tavern, and probably for uh, probably the equivalent of a nickel, you could in, in this tavern in 1669, at its inception, you could get a drink and the entree of the day, and uh, spend the night upstairs and have your horse boarded and fed outside. So as, as taverns progressed along, if we, we uh, move ahead into the 18th century, uh, obviously not in this tavern, but in taverns in Philadelphia, New York City, uh, there were the poche de la poche. Uh, you would have had the, the best cuisine going. And uh, also there would have been a quite the ethnic breakdown at that point once we hit the mid 18th century. Um, and as far as foods would have been supplied to that tavern, a choice of maybe five or six entrees total. But nevertheless, entrees would have been geared to the social class who was attending that tavern at that point in the, in the cities. Great, thank you. And Cynthia is asking, what was the age and condition of this tavern when you first got it? Uh, this tavern, uh, we use the word probably deplorable, but you, you could not see it on the outside because this tavern, dating 1669, is joined to the Samuel Shiver's house in 1724. But there's always the deception. Uh, we've had individuals here who have uh, actually named this property for its placards on the front, and they're totally wrong. Uh, unfortunately, we have there's individuals out there that just go to the internet looking for information. So they're uh, totally erudite. My advice to them is they need to get their hands dirty and get some dexterity in the hands and put them where their mouth is. So once you take the siding off of this house and you strip down some of the plaster on the inside, you can see the degradation of the timber framing. But this is white oak. White oak is very uh, pest resistant, um, insect resistant, rot resistant. So it's what was one of the steadfast timbers of the 17th and 19th century. So hence, once inside the walls, you can see where there was rot here and there. And that, we could soldier or we could sister in uh, the appropriate repairs and restorations needed to uh, put the house or the, its, its very early 17th century skeleton back in order. Uh, beyond that, the floorboards in this particular tab were taken up and they were hidden in the basement and they were full of uh, dirt and grime and you can imagine so it's extensive cleaning and sanding and unfortunately we have to use a dirty word refinishing but there was no choice these these uh, timbers were that far gone but not from a rot standpoint and uh, to my left here was the cage bar the cage bar was totally disassembled put into a crate for a number of years and kept in the basement in the same condition things have to be cleaned hand planed down before they can be put back up um, in the same token, the, the entry door, which would have been facing the Delaware Memorial Bridge of this particular tavern, was encased in a lead sleeve, and uh, it is in excellent condition. And uh, that's about it. But uh, just a lot of cleaning, a little bit of painting. But we must remember, in, in this tavern, in 1669 to 1700, there was virtually no paint in here. So it would have achieved its paint somewhere past probably 1710, 1730, or 40. Paint was way too expensive. For instance, even to paint the outside of, of this dwelling would have cost three to four times uh, to build it. So that, that's where we stand with the, uh, the condition. But the condition now is totally restored, and uh, you know we're going to be waiting for a, a new roof, uh, possibly late summer, of the same hand-split cedar-shaped variety. Wonderful. Well, um, in that same topic, Julian asks what type of restoration was involved and what specifically was restored in the tavern? Specifically, as I said, uh, 
lot of the skeleton uh, where joints come together. Um, a lot of joints, or some joints, were actually put together with, uh, with actually some glue, and uh, like a peg may be pounded in and glued in. Um, sometimes this was necessary and sometimes not. But where pegs meet and where wood would run down into the joints, that's where most of the restoration occurred. Up and beyond, again, cleaning the floors and, and all the wall paneling in here, which had been painted a god-awful white with a, a spattering of dots, uh, multicolored dots. So we have somebody that had a total disregard of history, the, the last individual that owned the house. And, uh, you know, so that had to be put back to new. Uh, the ceiling had been already stripped. Uh, unfortunately, you're looking at what I'm term terming the ceiling, which is the upper floor and the floor joists above me. Uh, originally, there would be no ceiling in here. What had happened was somewhere probably when uh, Samuel Shivers owned that he put plaster up. And hence he put lath up and plaster, and that's been torn down by somebody. So it's back to its original condition, uh, looking up toward what would be the ceiling, yes. And uh, you can see remnants of plaster and such in the nooks and crannies of the timbers. But uh, you can see these are original hand-hewn timbers. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of labeling here when, these, uh, when this dwelling was disassembled, where it was sitting at Route 40, Route 45, and brought here. And again, that leads us into the next question. Bill says, I understand the tavern was moved from its original location. Could you explain more about that? Yes, because John Shivers arrived here in 1650 from Monkstown, Ireland, and he came uh, awarded with several thousand acres of, uh, of land from King George I. And King George, King George was uh, seeking him to create housing and things of that nature, or not housing, but create uh, communities. So through John Shivers and then Samuel Shivers, land was sold over the next six, some 65 years to create the actual town of Woodstown, Pyle. He sold land to Pyle for Pyle's Grove, Penn to Penn's Grove, Carney for Carney's Point. Land was sold to John Fenwick for Salem. So this precedes uh, John Fenwick by a few years. Wonderful. Okay, and Brad asks, what is the origin of the terms bar and pub, and how might they differ from a tavern? Well, I think the origin of pub was these, these type of affairs were called public houses in, in England. And uh, public houses for people who were, needed a place to get their information. Uh, the interesting thing about being the oldest tavern, you can imagine tavern life here in the 17th century. Uh, this is one of the only few, maybe a handful, 20 dwellings in all of what we consider West Jersey at the time. And uh, imagine if you were born here and you have this dwelling that you could come to, this, quote, tavern. And for the first time, you start uh, social, socializing. So civilization really began here. Urban civilization began here in these rural outposts called taverns. But uh, in England, they were called public houses, and public houses were called also coffee houses, a place where people could have breakfast, could have lunch, dinner, and this would have been a very crude um, version of that. But hence, the, uh, the colonists liked the term tavern over a pub, but it was occasionally or sometimes called a grog house. And a grog was an 18th century drink, uh, usually found by taverns down on the river in Philadelphia and uh, Boston. It was a uh, very low-end rum that was thinned out with uh, like a lemon juice. Interesting. And Alice is asking, which genders and ethnicities would we see in colonial taverns? Well, let me just finish the, the, the last part of the last question, I'm sorry. Um, where the term bar came come from? So in, in colonial America, the most sought-after commodity would have been alcohol. And uh, so just imagine you had a... Uh, a person who owns this establishment, um, he has to do some, he or she has to do business dealings outside. You have a room full of patrons, which, which would only have been six, seven, eight, nine patrons, and they have to leave to the front of the dwelling. They would close this bar, this bar could lift out, and these bars would have been latched and locked. There's a large period lock here to keep out uh, any thieves, uh, whether it be throughout the night or actually patrons sitting here, because alcohol was a thing. I mean, uh, there was no, uh, no drinking of water because of all the impurities that it contained. Everyone would get sick when they drank water. So even young babies were drinking beer. 
So hence alcohol or hard cider, which would have been, in that time, would have been rum, hard cider, or ale. Most of it would have been produced here. And everything was locked up by these cages or bars, and today they're called colonial cage bars. So hence the term bar has taken all the aurora of a tavern, uh, but really not used back then. I've heard some local comment, comments from uh, people quite not in the know. They think the word bar originated from like a brass bar you put your feet on, not so. so. And I'm sorry, can we go back to that question Absolutely. Again? Alice is asking, which genders and ethnicities would we find in colonial taverns? Well, Alice, that, that varies over the life and duration of taverns in, in the colonies. In the beginning, in the very beginning, in this tavern, you would have been see, seated by Native Americans. Actually, John Shivers um, was working with the Native Americans right from the start. Uh, when this dwelling was moved here in 1724, he uh, hired two Native Americans and, and two oxen to drag this on a sled, two miles of assembly here. But yet, you would have had Native Americans actually working and cooking here for the owner of the tavern. So you would have had Native Americans, maybe a free slave or two, uh, here, and, and, and uh, quote, white America would have been here at that point. But as we proceeded 1700, 1710, 20, um, racism began to grow rapid. You would have never seen past 1720 a Native American or a slave, a free slave in here, never at all. Um, and as we Maybe we'll touch on, touch on this later, but as we get further into the 18th century, um, the women play into this because in the beginning, women were actually here operating taverns, but they would have been allow allowed in these type of rural establishments in the beginning. Um, but as we go deeper into the 18th century, women would, women would slowly be pushed out as far as patrons go, but possibly they would be owners or uh, operators of the taverns. And the crazy, as life goes around a circle, when we get to Victorian times, taverns were still, well, we have taverns today, but taverns were still very prominent in, in Victorian times. Women were banned. So let's push ahead to maybe 1860, 1855, women were not allowed in taverns. So not allowed to own a tavern, not allowed to be in the tavern. So, you know, the age of Victorian. So there you go. Very interesting, Greg. Now, Spencer is asking, uh, was liquor and the ability to operate taverns regulated by the government? When this tavern uh, came to be, John Shivers built, built it. He copied a public house that he'd seen in London. And uh, at this point, and just a little bit of background about John Shivers, his interest in having all this land by the King of England, what he wanted to do, he wanted a venue to sell his land. So being on a popular outpost like this, one of the first outposts in New Jersey. So if you consider that Salem had, you know, ships of the day coming in at this point, where this tower was originally located, it received a lot of traffic coming through. Some prominent, some non-prominent, some very low-end people, but a great mix of people coming by wanting to know where could you buy land. So John Shivers has the answer. I have the land from the king. So it was a good thing, and it really aided and bedded expansion, because remember, this was here well before Philadelphia was here. So these urban colonial tavern outposts laid down the roots, but yes, there was no government regulation. The regulation started coming in when the Quakers started coming in, maybe 10, 15 years, although they were coming with the chime of John Fenwick, yes, but we had hordes of Quakers coming 10, 15 years after John Shivers came here, and the Quakers were very entrepreneurial people, as were the Puritans in New England. And they both had this attitude that uh, we like to make a lot of money, and but we like to project ourselves as not using alcohol. So the Quakers came in and they helped to set up a lot of the local governments and these local hamlets and towns. And, and uh, they put forth legislation to regulate these taverns. So you had to buy a license essentially from the Quakers who were running the local governments every year. Um, and it was, these agreements were based on different things. Sometimes it was based on the amount of alcohol you sold, alcohol consumption, the type of food you, food you sold, was uh, people or individuals sleeping in your uh, establishment and things like this. But when we pushed into the 18th century, say in Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Charleston, uh, the 
government really stepped in. So as our fledgling government in our major cities, they started uh, promoting tavern life, and they started promoting building taverns because the government saw dollar signs in its eyes. So it no longer was the Quakers and the Puritans, but yet the Quakers and the Puritans, I may add, throughout the, the history of colonial tavern life, proclaimed, you know, we don't drink, and alcohol isn't as bad, but they don't care if you get drunk. Uh, it's almost it's almost like, it reminds us of like the state of Pennsylvania today. They have liquor stores they can sell to everybody, but yet if you get stopped by the police and you have some liquor on your breath, you're in trouble. So why should our government be propagating this? So. Very good. And that, once again, leads us into our next question from Lily. Was there excessive drunkenness and other vices found in tavern life? It became, it became obsessive, but you must realize that everyone that came into the tavern is drinking alcohol, whether it be hard cider, rum, or, uh, or ale. So uh, children, adults were drinking. So maybe everyone didn't have a buzz on all the time, but they had something going on. And it wonders, uh, it begs the question, how did we get to where we are today in this country? So, you know, with that excessiveness. Um, but obviously, if you had individuals sitting in this tavern, there's nowhere else to go. There's no other dwelling except the small cabin that you probably live in down the woods to the right. Um, you would have consumed a couple drinks a night, and there was a lot of drunkenness. So the tavern usually closed down 8, 8.30, 9 o'clock and everybody had to go upstairs and go to bed or they, they went out the door. And keep in mind, there was two rooms here, particularly in the side of the key. And uh, in the one room, which was the deluxe room, you would have had two, maybe three beds, almost encompassing the entire floor space. So each bed, you probably could have sold six places. So six people would have been sleeping in the same bed with a burlap blanket and, and uh, Keep in mind the mattress were made of some of straw, some of corn cob husk, you know, the husk that you pull back. And in the other room, the lower end room, the economy room, you would have been sleeping on the floor with a burlap bag, so, or burlap blanket rather. And wow. Kind of meeting new friends there, so it could have been very interesting. And keep in mind, people by and large weren't bathing, but you know, once a month, even if that, they probably wouldn't have had a good bath, so. It, things could have been quite right there. I have to tell you, Greg, yeah. I think I would go for the economy room and yeah. not be six to a bed. Yes. But uh, Sarah asks, how did colonial taverns differ from their English counterparts, which you did touch on briefly, but if you could expound on that. Well, they, they differed in, in a few ways. There was uh, number one size. It was, uh, they were absolutely huge with vaulted ceilings. And uh, this tavern did not get uh, clocks. As you see, there's two, two long case clocks going in this tavern till around 1700, but your typical tavern in London dating back to 1650 would have had a timepiece in it. And the timepiece was pivotal because no one had a clock, no one had a watch, no one had a sundial, no one knew what time it was. So that's one reason to go to the tavern, otherwise socialization, drinking, eating. Our, our time pieces in the room, which are dating probably 16, 1665, 1700, have single hands, and that's because the proletariat could not, uh, they could not read. But there were other reasons why, um, comparatively speaking, um, the obviously the English, even the smaller English pubs, people were much more educated than in the colonies. People were just flat out illiterate here, and they would come to. At times, a, a tavern keeper here would hire someone who could read to come in and read the news of the week or the news of the month to the illiterate. And that was a good reason to come and have a drink and have a meal and to catch up on things. Who's winning the, who's winning the war or, you know, who's coming over? Or are we going to rebel against the crown? What, what's happening? Uh, so, so that was, but much more literate in England. So people read, I mean, you know, maybe to a second, third, or fourth grade level, but here illiteracy reigned. And what you would have found in, found in a tavern like this was signage with like fingers pointing this way or fingers showing, you know, the, the way to the exit or food here or the bar because people couldn't read at all. So uh, very interesting stuff. But the size, the food that was served, the accommodations were much better in England. Basically, there you Thank you. 